Down upon the underworld to smash Ganglin comes the mysterious, all powerful character who is a problem to the police, but a crusader for law. In reality, Dan Garrett, a rookie patrolman, loved by everyone, but suspected by none of being the Blue Beetle. As the Blue Beetle, he hides behind a strange mask and a suit of impenetrable blue chain armor, flexible as silk, but stronger than steel. Today's episode of The Blue Beetle is entitled, Spirit Don't Talk. In every city and small town throughout the country, there are certain individuals who claim to have supernatural powers, mediums who claim that through them, the dead speak. Only a few have firmly believed in their supernatural power and endeavored to use it for good. Even they have been exploited for dishonest purposes by unscrupulous individuals and groups of individuals. As our story opens, Patrolman Dan Garrett, who in secret is really the Blue Beetle, is discussing the fortune-telling racket with his friend and confidant, Dr. Brown. Uh, tell me, Danny, why is it the district attorney hasn't done something about this situation? Well, in the first place, it's hard to get witnesses to testify against these fortune-tellers and mediums. In the second place, what can witnesses testify to? Why, uh, why, uh, that they were told that the... That they'd take an ocean voyage or meet a blonde man who would be the great love of their life? Can't put anybody in jail for that. No, I suppose not. That isn't the part of this racket that causes the police and the district attorney concern. Oh, what does? You see, when a person starts going to fortune tellers, he or she is a marked man or woman. He or she is registered, as it were, by a great ring. Registered? Ring? Yes. Everything about the client is noted by the fortune teller. Assistants note the wearing apparel, its quality, style, where purchased, and so on. Traits of character are studied, weighed, and measured. Clients are urged to talk about themselves. And if possible, names and addresses are secured. All this information goes into a central bureau to be tabulated and cross-indexed for future reference. Well, bless my soul. I had no idea such an elaborate system existed. Sure, there's a regular ring that controls the racket. Well, what about spiritualism and mediums? Are these so-called mediums part of this racket? Well, most of them. They constitute the most dangerous part of the racket. Well, how do you mean? Well, when they get hold of a client, some susceptible individual who believes it's possible to talk to the loved ones who've died, they work on that individual's mind influence that individual to commit acts he or she would never think of committing if left alone. What's the connection between fortune tellers and mediums? The fortune tellers pick out easy marks. And if considered worthwhile material to work on, they're inveigled into visiting a spiritualist or urged to sit in on a seance. My, my, my. People are so gullible. Yes, they are. They have to be protected from themselves. Uh, somebody's in the store. Uh, I'll be back in a minute. Probably Mike Manigan. If it is, send him back. Uh, hello, Doc. Is Danny the daredevil dude patrolling this beat? <laughs> yes, Danny's back in the laboratory. Uh, probably <laughs> cooking up a witch's brew of some sort. Uh, you mind if I go no, in? Oh, no. Go right back, Officer Manigan. Hello, Mike. Uh, hello, Danny. <laughs> Are you ready to visit the mediums? Ready and waiting. Hey, you look very smart in your civvies. Yeah, they, I think your advice was good. They'll never suspect we're cops in these clothes. I don't know about that. My wind-blown barb and your red face. They don't look like bookkeepers. Well, where are you two boys going? To uh, a, a seance. <laughs> you mean seance, Doc. Yeah, <laughs> we're going to talk with the dead. Uh, who's the medium? Well, he calls himself Professor Windrip. And where's the seance being held? At Windrip's house out on Elm Street. You know that old place that sits back from the street? Yes, yes, I know it. Uh, people used to say it was haunted. That's the place. Well, uh, come on, Patrolman Garrett. Uh, uh, pardon me, uh, Mr. Garrett. Uh, you go ahead, Mike. 
I want to ask Doc something. I'll be with you in a minute. Okay, I, I'll wait out front for you. Say, Doc, can I borrow your X-ray camera with a special infrared lens? Oh, certainly, Danny. I'll get it for you. Just a minute. Now, what, what can I carry it in? Oh, here. It's quite flat. Here, here it is. Here, put it in this briefcase. Oh, thanks, Doc. I'll see you later. If the spirits don't get me. In another part of the city, an interesting discussion is being held. Banker James Henley is talking with his son, John, and his nephew, William. I want you, John, and you, William, to accompany me to the seance, Professor Windrip. May you be able to communicate with my my dead son, Rodney. Oh, Dad, it's all a fake. This spiritualism and mediums and such stuff. I don't believe Professor Windrip or anybody else can communicate with the dead. Well, I do. You only have to take one look at the professor to know that he's unusual. He has that faraway expression that psychic people have. Oh, nonsense. Uh, William is right, John. Professor Windrip is gifted beyond most mortals. I'm sure he will be able to communicate with my elder son who was killed in Spain. Uh, perhaps Rodney will be able to advise me in my financial affairs. He was always so right about things. And I'm getting old, and I need his advice. Yes, and I'm sure his advice will still be good, Uncle James. Yes, William. I'm glad you have the right attitude toward these things. Well, let's get started to the seance. The sooner we get there, the sooner it will be over. Who's going to be out at Windrip's place, Danny? I'm not sure. Charlie Storm with a son told me that Banker Henley's a frequenter of Windrip's seances. Well, how, uh, how are we going to get in there? Charlie got me two cards from a girlfriend of his who's a hostess in one of those gypsy tea rooms. Do you think they'll suspect us? I don't know, but let me do the talking. You just keep still and look psychic. And how does a guy look when he looks psychic? He just stares straight at everything and everybody. Just as if you were looking through them at the immortal spheres. That's the way I look when I've been hit on the head. Well, I'll, I'll talk you one before we go in, if that'll help. Yeah, never mind. <laughs> I can look psychic without your help. <laughs> okay. That's the house ahead. Yeah, it's a pleasant-looking spot for a murder. Are you healed? No, I didn't bring a gun. Well, I did. And if any goes to the party spirit, that's gay with me. I'm going to use it. Now, well, here we are. Come on, Mike, and remember to look psychic. Okay, Danny. Good evening. All you expected? Uh, we have cards. Very good. Will you come in, please? The seance is about to begin. Thank you. Uh, who are these gentlemen, Gerke? They have cards, sir. Are you Professor Windrup? Yes, I am. Uh, this is Mr. Michael P. Manigan, and I'm Mr. Van Norden Garrett. We were recommended to you by the Gypsy Tea Room. My friend here is psychic. Oh, I see. Well, uh, come in, gentlemen. They're right in here. Uh, this is Mr. James Henley, the banker. His son, John, and his nephew, William. Mr. Manigan uh, and Mr. Garrett. Pleased to meet you. Meet you. Now, will you all take seats, please? You and Mr. Manigan sit here, Mr. Garrett. Thank you. We sit in a circle and hold hands. Uh, Mr. Henley, you sit here on my left. Between Mr. Garrett and me. John, you sit on my right. And William, you sit next to your cousin John. Between him and Mr. Manning. Right. Here we are. This is a lot of poppycock. Uh, John, John, be quiet. If you don't want to sit in, leave the room. Oh, all right, Father. I'll keep quiet. I'm afraid your son is not in a receptive mood, Mr. Henley. No, he'll be all right, Professor. He's young, that's all. Yes. Now... We'll each take the hand of the persons on either side of us. And I'll put the lights out with this switch in the floor at my feet. Quiet, everybody. Relax. Banish thoughts of this mundane world. And let your minds wander out into the infinite. What was that sound? My teeth chattering. Oh, 
that you, Rodney, my son? Yes, father. Your son who was killed in Spain. Speak to me. Speak to me. Rodney, are you well? I cannot rest. A heavy burden lies on my soul. What is the burden on your soul, Rodney? My brother John does not love you. Only William loves you. That's a lie. William is a crook. This seance is... <sighs> Light. Switch on those lights. What happened here? John. John. What's wrong? Well, I think... What, what, what happened? What happened here? Oh, look. Look, my son John. They're on the floor. Stand back, everybody. Manigan, cover those exits. Hmm. Well, he's dead, all right. Stabbed in the back. Wait a minute. What is this? Who are you to give orders in my house? Patrolman Tan Garrett. My psychic friend is Officer Manigan. Oh, and if anybody attempts to leave this room, this gun of mine will speak. And it won't be a psychic message either. Call headquarters, Danny. This is a case of murder. <laughs> Later, back at the little apothecary shop of Dr. Franz, Dan Garrett and Dr. Franz are examining two photographs which have just been developed. Now, Doc, mm -hmm. this is the first one I snapped with the X-ray camera. It shows the interior of the room where the seance was held. Uh, uh, what? Uh, what's that dark spot there on the wall? Where? Oh. Hmm. That looks like a like a loudspeaker behind a large painting. Uh, that's probably where the voice came from that old man Henley thought was the voice of his dead son, Rodney. Yeah, he was the old man's favorite son. He volunteered to fight in Spain and was killed in battle. Uh, let's, uh, let's see the other photograph. Yeah, right. I took this one just as John said. This is a lie. It shows the group seated in a circle. Look, at, uh, look there. It's the murderer. His hand is clutching the dagger raised to strike. It even shows the cotton he wrapped around the hilt to avoid leaving fingerprints. This photograph alone will convict the murderer of John Henley. Are you going to phone police headquarters to hold no. him? No. If they hold him, we may not be able to run the higher-ups in the racket there. Oh, earth. then you think the murderer of John Henley was not the top man? Oh, no, no. He was just part of the ring. The brains of the racket are higher up. But they should have realized that John Henley's death would bring down the police on their necks. Somebody made a miscue there. I don't think the ring planned John's death. What do you think their plan was? Simply to use a dead son Rodney's fake voice to work on the old man and influence him to let his nephew William advise him. And in time, persuade him to make William his heir. But why? William is probably being used by this gang of racketeers. The old man should die, leaving his vast fortune to William, then William would be blackmailed into coming across with a large sum of money to the racketeers. Mm. What devilish things evil minds can think up. Yes. Oh, by the way, Doc, put those negatives in a safe place. Uh, they'll be safe with me, Danny. All right. Well, the Blue Beetle is going into action on this gang of crooked buzzards. Well, what are you going to do? The Blue Beetle is paying several visits tonight. Before another day dawns, the spiritualist racket will be smashed. <laughs> the murderer of John Henley. What will the Blue Beetle discover at Professor Windrip's residence? Whose warped mind is behind all these fiendish schemes to prey upon honest but superstitious and ignorant persons? Off through the night speeds the Blue Beetle in his crusade against crime. Crime. <laughs>